first of all, uh, well, one, I, I congratulate any artist that uh, completes an album oh. because you know it's such a it's such a labor of love to to plant a seed and to see it come to fruition and then see it through. So I always ask people when they finish their records, like once the final thing is over, once you mastered it, once it's once it's done, like what was the what was the first thing you did? Is it is there a, a certain release that you have to do or do you get to process like when an album is over and, and it's done? <laughs> got the whole crew in here right now. Basically what happened was we got master got the masters and I started doing press. Oh, so you never got the process of letting I had three it three days where I turned my phone off and then it was like BAM. Okay. So people have been asking me about this record and like what does it mean and how does it feel? I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'm still So still, immediately out the gate, like We started we started moving. Okay. It's like I feel like for me at least I have to sit with it for like a week before that process starts just to let your kids go. Because then you're going to send it out in the world to get judged. Yeah, and... nah, there was, I didn't really have much of that. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. So you're in the process. So mm -hmm. tell me the, the genesis of JPEG Raw. Like, when did you know that it's time to start a new project? For you, are you just an ongoing stream of song ideas and then you gather the best 10 or 11? Or is it like... I'm gonna start a new album now. Yeah, no, I never think I'm gonna do, I never say I'm gonna sit down and start a project. I'm always doing something. I'm always on the MPC or messing with the keyboards or, you know, sitting there strumming guitar, doing something. So I'm constantly coming up with ideas. So I did this song that's on the record, This Is Who We Are, early 2020. And okay. shelved it. It was just collecting dust for like two years. I got serious about making an album because folks were going, hey, What's up with this album? Because it was pandemic, so we were just sitting around right. Tuesdays, Thursdays, you know, barbecuing, brisket, hanging out, mezcal wines flowing, just right. coming up with ideas, just cutting whatever we liked. Right. So then we kind of whittled it down. It took forever, but 2022, we started kind of getting serious. How, how does one stay creative when it feels like the apocalypse is happening? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I know the further that we get away from 2020, um, I'm now weirded out that I'm now having fond, fond memories of the pandemic. Like, mm. hey, remember when we were all like in that farmhouse together, all 18 of us, and we were like campfiring and telling ghost stories. And like now I'm having fuzzy memories about it. But yeah. like in real time, you know, it was waking up every day to find out my uncle died, or my favorite rapper died. So for you, when death is looming large, what was it like to be creative, but to also realize the, the reality that we're living in? Well, at, at the beginning of 2020, that was, we just finished rocking at the Grammys. Yo, that's right. Right? Oh God, this is like <laughs> weeks later. <laughs> Right. So, you know, it was, it was all hype and, you know, it was exciting. I'm walking out with my trophies and I'm like, 2020, let's get it. It's go right. time, right? Yeah, I did feel like 2020 was my year. Right. Like, this is my year. Right, right. And, and then, then... everybody goes, sit y'all ass down for a minute, right? <laughs> so we didn't know, I didn't know what to do. It's March. I just had my third kid, switched up the band, got a new rhythm section. Right. And then we can't do nothing. I, got, I built a studio out at my spot, and I'm just sitting there by myself with like a Neve console, mm -hmm. just trying to figure it out. Finally, we started getting the band together. And I was like, we're gonna do, let's, let's do a party record. That was my mind, I was like, cause it was 2020, the world is, is ours. I wanna do something fun. Like, I don't wanna be the blues guy. You know, I just did yeah. nigga run, nigga run. Right, I'm right. I'm like, all right, that's enough. That album, the album you did was actually the album for 2020, believe it, like, weird enough. Right. Right. Oops. Right. So, <laughs> so I'm thinking we're gonna do something exciting. And then it just kept happening. All the bullshit kept happening. The death, despair. There was no going out in the real world. Mm -hmm. So I'm being informed by my feed, for better or for worse. But I couldn't figure out lyrically what I wanted to say, because I would go from 
angry, fear, elation, mm -hmm. celebratory based on, you know, it was confusing. There wasn't a lot of interaction. I usually move around and, and walk around and, and go to shows and I'm very much, I like to mix and mingle, but you know, kind of stay in the cut. There was none of that. So it was like me, my screaming ass kids, my wife, and then every Thursday or something, the band would come through and that was all we had. And then it just whittled down to, I'm just talking to my boys right now right and what their perspective is on life and how we feel about this and all we can do is communicate here and like what we're seeing in real time mm -hmm. and how this is affecting our families and such and such lost somebody or you know it was so like, all right well, let's get real about it then you know and that was kind of like it was just it was that and then my family was growing it was the first time i really spent time with my family and a, like forever like i got to know my wife i got to know my kids you know what I mean? And, and not just seeing them grow. And, yeah. You know, every few weeks, you know, my daughter's saying something new and I'm like, how did I miss this? And right. I'm there for all of it. And I was like, whoa, all right. This is what it is right now. Let me just focus on this. Well, fun fact. Yeah, a lot of us not only got to know our households, mm. but we also got to know ourselves. Mm -hmm. So how was the self-discovery process? Because you know, I assume that like me, that's probably the longest stretch of alone time that you had with yourself. Yes. And I had to go through a personal transformation in 2020, which actually made me, I think performing with you at the Grammys almost inspired us, the Roots, as a group to like, yeah, where's our, where's our record at? Like, let's rise to the challenge. Mm. And so a whole bunch of songs like that came out, but then... I started doing the personal work and discovered that I really have not made time for joy in my life and happiness. And then suddenly the way I started feeling inside was the opposite of what the music was. And so then I felt like I wanted to do a more lighthearted record. So were you even conflicted on should you be the messenger of the world? Like the, and or did you feel the pressure? Cause it, I think, there's there's a sort of unspoken pressure that we put on you as like you're the next one you're the chosen one you're gonna you know because he's not here anymore and he's not here anymore and it's been six decades since that person was here who's left dun, dun, dun. like do you <laughs> whew, do you feel that pressure sometimes that that we're putting on you to be that person yeah, I absolutely felt that pressure. And so in that whole time of sitting around and self-reflecting, I wasn't hearing what people were thinking about me. I was not in the spotlight to be criticized or judged or compared to anything mm -hmm. or set up to be something. I was like, I'm just G from Austin, Texas, who loves music. And so in this whole pandemic thing, I started listening to Steve Vai again, Eric Johnson and going towards all this music that I hadn't really spent my time focusing on because I'm this set up to be the next blues guy. Mm -hmm. So I'm focusing my energy on that. So in the pandemic, I was like, man, fuck all that. I like Johnny Hartman and John Coltrane. I like the Wailers. I like this girl, Mal DeVisa. I like it's Herb Albert. I like that stuff. So I'm not gonna lean into what people wanted me to lean into because I noticed that I didn't love that, you know? And so doing this land and, and that whole thing and you know, being that guy, I was also sitting there talking to like MSNBC in one of those little boxes with like motherfuckers with the, <laughs> with the capital in the background. And I was like, yeah. this is not who I am. <laughs> right, this is not right. what I want to be. This is not who I am. I'm not this political mm -hmm. rah rah guy. I'm just a dude from South Austin, Texas, who loves music, who fell in love with the sound of Jimi Hendrix, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Curtis Mayfield, the Jackson Five, mm -hmm. Stevie Wonder. So I'm leaning into that. And I don't care what anybody thinks, you know? I was like, I took off the big dumb hat and these boots were killing my back. And I'm like, I'm in some barefoot ass shoes right now. Like, I right. get that. I'm just gonna be comfortable in me and take it or leave it, you know? That was kind of the whole approach. It's like self reflectance It's like, I cannot be what everybody expects me to be. Can you give me uh, insight? What made you uh, title the album? JPEG Raw, like? Uh, JPEG Raw, I titled it 
I basically got back into photography again. Okay. And also sitting there during that pandemic and you just seeing everybody's feeds. The no filter and all this and that or whatever. And right. so just being a camera nerd, the JPEG is like could be this corrected version, raw is like something you can mess with and post or whatever. It's just like whatever image you're choosing to put forward, you know, you have that option of putting your best foot forward or being true to yourself. I won't post necessarily the negative things. Here I am with the Grammys. Here I am with my wife, the kids. Here's right. the flex, because that is good for the brand or right. whatever. But you know, my day is shitty, you know, or, or whatever. So it's just like that conflict of, of putting everything out there or not, and just being bombarded with images. You know, like constant image, like information. You could, you could have a picture and a tag that says a, something like a some sort of narrative that's completely false, and you just never know. Right. So it just kind of had to do with all that, and and just cameras around all the time. Like, look at this. Right. <laughs> it's a lot. There's a lot of cameras. You know. Um, we, well, I was going to ask you. Everyone in the pandemic had a pivot or discovery of. Oh, I can do this too. Mm -hmm. And for cats like you and I, who, like I've never not been on a stage for like more than two to three weeks since the age of five. So for the first time in my life, in the pandemic, that was the longest stretch. Like we went eight months without not being in front of a camera. So, I, you know, filmmaking was like my new superpower. So for you, you're saying that photography was yours? Absolutely. Was it before music or just like, you discovered this in the pandemic, like, oh, let me start uh, taking photos. Uh, no, I was like a photography nerd in high school. Okay. So I was in the dark room and developing all my own photos, and the negatives, all that kind of stuff. So I fell in love with it then. And then I kind of put the camera down when it kind of shifted and it was kind of on me. And I felt weird just walk around being this guitar player, right. the next one up. And I'm like, it's this nerd with this camera all the time. So I just put it down and then I was like, Fuck it. I really love it. Also filmmaking, like I'm inspired by what you've been doing. It's like I really am passionate about all the arts, you know. So but photography you. is just like my outlet. I could walk around by myself and just, you know, capture what's important to me. Okay. Probably the first thing that I've noticed in listening to this record is um is probably the most this is the broadest stroke that you've taken your music in mm. terms of the, the sonic texture. Um, mixing organic sounds with synthetic sounds and uh, different types of, of rhythms and genres until the end of the world, like just you and your voice alone, mm -hmm. which, you know, I'm sure I'm not the first person to tell you, like you should do an entire album with just of that level. That. Like, and that was just an interlude. I was so mad. I was like, dude, like, <laughs> I want a full song of that. Yeah, that's kind of a vibe. Um, so what, what was this, the process in, first of all, receiving these songs, but then um, deciding whether or not they could all be cohesive in one project? Mm. If I'm being honest, man, I, I've seen you guys do whatever the fuck you wanted to with the mixing of the organics and the yeah. synths and, you know, watching the show. Like the way that you can, you can go in between genres so seamlessly, that's inspiring for somebody like me. You know what I mean? Like to see brothers that look like you do whatever the fuck they want and execute like perfectly, I consistently. I think with, with us though, it's like, okay, so you know, like you said, like the, the burden of being the, the next one, the burden yeah. of being Gary Clark Jr. versus who's G from Austin want to be today at this very present yeah, yeah. moment. I almost feel as though for us, our pressure is like black music is almost non-existent. And at first it was just like, okay, let's just represent everything hip hop. But then once we noticed like, oh God, there's like maybe two or three bands left with major record deals. And it was like, okay, well, let's represent that. But now the idea of a group, the idea of more than a solo act making a record together is almost like non-existent. So 
I almost feel like we are trying to represent every genre of music. Like pretty soon, I'm almost certain that music might be questionable, you know? How so? What do you mean? I don't know. Like, I, I, someone asked me, like, what do you think will be... I, I'll tell you what. I, I now, you know, like at the end of the year when... Uh, they check your algorithms and they sort of snitch on what you've been listening to all year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, ever since the pandemic, just to calm me down because I've been so much into meditating and sitting silent, um, I'll listen to, I mean, I listen to more like uh, uh, Kashi Bells and Tones. Mm-hmm. I'll listen to that. Like maybe 80% of my listening is that and 20% is other music. Like when I'm making playlists for you guys or whatever. Yeah, right, right. But I don't know. For you, though, it, it feels natural. And like the other unspoken genius who's not with us anymore that often gets, you know, you get compared with <laughs> from Minneapolis. Um, he, too, was able to flex his his soul muscles, his rock muscles and all those things. Um, for you, though, like what was the point, break, breaking point of just fuck it like I'm putting these both together for me the whole world was shut down so I didn't even know what we were gonna do I didn't know when we were gonna be back out again I didn't know when records were gonna drop so I was just making stuff just to make it I didn't care what it was mm-hmm. you know it was I wasn't making a record for Gary Clark Jr. the chosen one I was just making music like I, I went back to the garage like a 15 year old kid in the garage okay and Let's just try it. I, I say jokingly, I turned into a 12 year old again during the pandemic and I went, like at some point I took a, a turn. It was like a fork in the road and I chose blues. Mm-hmm. You know, heavy into this, but. Cause that's what, I mean, as a kid, people were going, you gotta hang on to blues. Never forget Jimmy Reed. Right. Eddie Taylor's the best of all time. You know, um, the burden Freddie of King. carrying <laughs> right. his so on I'm, your back. I'm a 13 year old. Like I'm chasing girls. And I'm oh wait, time out. That was happening when you were 13. Th- 14. I yeah. thought you meant that was happening 14 days ago. You mean this is <laughs> happening since you were? Yeah, since I was a kid. Oh, the like, pressure. Like a little kid. You okay. Know? And so you know, I'm a kid. I'm going down. I'm playing at this blues club, Antones, and I'm hanging out with James Cotton and Pine Top Perkins, and I'm on stage with guys who play with Muddy Waters. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Buddy Guy. All this. As a teenager, got X's on my hand, and I'm going back to school, and then. Folks are playing DMX in the car on the way to school. And folks are playing what, whatever. 97, Jay-Z, yeah, DMX. You know what I'm saying? Like all Neptunes. of that. So I'm listening to that. I'm listening to Outkast. I'm also in Texas, so the whole Houston scene is popping. So, right. you know, Chopped and Screwed is going on. And I'm just, I'm into all that. Mm-hmm. So I've always done different things. It's what's presented publicly that kind of, you know, so it's not new to me to, explore any of these new genres. It's just new to release them to people and them go, <gasps> I kind of like it though. So something that uh, I feel is is brand new uh, for a lot of us and us, uh, I'm speaking of as, as, as black people, um, definitely in 2020, I felt as though there was a slight Opening or, or loosening of the grips when it turn when it when it comes to our vulnerable uh, our vulnerability uh, our need to express our emotions and process our emotions, um, which really hasn't happened before. You know, because we keep our vulnerability close to the chest because you know for for a lot of us you can't be caught out there being vulnerable with your emotions because, you know, we're always on guard. We live in fight or flight. Um, Lyrically speaking, how were you able to deal with your emotions? In other words, like the anger that you felt with George Floyd or or the, the, the beauty of singing with just your guitar alone in those moments. Like, describe your lyrical process in terms of how things come. Do lyrics come first or does the music come first and then you have to find a home for lyrics? Um, for me, music comes first. It's kind of an attitude thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a soundtrack to something. Mm-hmm. I'm not, a story I'm not quite sure. This, this one was really tough for me because I was stuck. I didn't want to 
be vulnerable and tell everybody all my business mm -hmm. because that just seemed like gross. Right? It's is gotta, it? It's, is it? Look, <laughs> see, that's the vast the battle. It's like I, you know, to be super specific, right on point, every detail of, of everything is cool. But also, what about having it or, or crafting the song to where people don't necessarily think it's all about me? You could flip it and make it your own. You know what I mean? And relate to it. If you were to sing it, maybe you, it could resonate with you the same way it resonates with me. So well, I don't know. That's how songs work, I assume. Like you hear something and you're like, hey, I feel that and I feel that. But I think oftentimes people, uh, especially artists, are afraid, one, to let out their business too much about yeah, right. their personal lives. But yeah, then yeah. also, do I look crazy out here <laughs> expressing... You know, th and there's only a few, t like, I believe in the anger when Stevie Wonder is yelling in the third verse of Living for the City. You know, my heart broke mm -hmm. listening to the last 12 seconds of She's Out of My Life when I'm like eight years old. Clearly hear Michael Jackson cry because obviously this affected him. So it's, th but the, for black artists, that's rarely allowed because, you know, we've always had this whole, like, I'm going to be all right, like that whole front thing. And to be human in your music is such a hard thing. But you seem to navigate it well. So mm. I guess I'm asking you, yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that a calculated decision? Or are you just stream of conscious, like, this is how I feel right now? And I was like, it's time to stop bullshitting. You know, it's time to, like, a song like Habits, mm -hmm. that was tough. Like, I couldn't get through a take without getting emotional. Really? I couldn't do it. Yeah, I couldn't do it. It oh. felt great to me. Okay. Because it, it was like, okay, I'm, here it is. That not everything is cool here, you know. I'm not giving you the Instagram feed. I'm giving you the, this shit is tough. It sucks. And um, I'm going to sing to you about it for nine minutes. I was going to say, it's a 10-minute song, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just put it all out there. And it, it was, it's scary, you know. But it's good, and I think we have, it's important for us to be vulnerable as humans, as black men too. Uh -huh. I, I think we're scared that it can be flipped and you'd be seen as weakness and folks will pounce. Like that's yeah. kind of the thing. But I think folks need to hear it, man. Otherwise, we go crazy and we self-medicate and do fucked up shit to ourselves and each other, you know? Where it's like a conversation, like an honest conversation about what's going on here can be so much more helpful than grabbing a bottle or like putting something up in the air, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. So you co-produced this record with Jacob Skiba. Um, what was the division of labor between uh, you two in the studio process? Like, I think it's necessary sometimes to have another voice in the room, but also, you know, I was raised on artists that did everything themselves, you know, produce, arrange, and then Stevie Wonder, then no, 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 Prince, Prince and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so, what is it to have uh, another person in the room, a collaborator, sort of check you? And what was the division of labor on that? Uh, well, for this particular project, I had been manning the boards the whole time. So, I was producing, engineering, arranging, mixing. I was doing all this for Yikes. like like a good year I suppose mm -hmm. and then the world started opening back up and you know after I got COVID a couple times I was like all right you know whatever okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean here it is right so uh Jacob came through and was listening I, we recorded most of the stuff at my house on the floor it was the band um and then right it was pretty much done except for a couple songs I think Maktoub wasn't done and Habits wasn't done. Mm -hmm. So Jacob basically came in and said, your mixes are trash. Um, it's too dense. And we need to trim some of this fat. Because I like I, everything. Big fat ass drums, big fat ass guitars. Right. And the vocals are this big. Okay. Right? And they're like, no, this, you're doing it wrong. Good effort, but that's a fail. You know, and um, so I really respected that, you know. So he came in, he wiped the whole board, came back from 
it's not bad. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I know that feeling, man. I know the feeling when you're like, you're making the souffle and you present it to someone and they just smack you. This is like a cliffhanger to me. Like, and then what happened? Like, And then, you know, it, it, it came to a dialogue about what really translates to folks and like what sounds muddy, what's too much, you know, just the real engineering mm -hmm. mixing conversations, you know? So there was parts that were a little gratuitous and it's like, you don't need that. You've already got a part over here that's kind of doing the same thing. You're just doing it because you're in the studio like smoking weed by yourself and no one's here to tell you no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so his job was? So his job was, yeah, right. like, okay. come on, I get it. And he comes from a traditional uh, music recording space, like recording, you know, live to tape, you know, he comes from recording folks like Willie Nelson, and, mm -hmm. you know, folks like that. It's like you may only get two or three takes. So we, he kind of helped balance the organic versus the, the digital and me going too crazy and kind of keeping it so I'm recognizable as an artist. You know. That you're not getting lost in your own work? I was getting lost, man. Okay. I have some well, weird funky joints. Yes. I was going to say, do you, do you have a director's cut of like your version? It gets weird. Save it for the 20th anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got some weird That's stuff. That's the joint I'm going to rock with. Uh -huh. uh, I've mentioned Stevie Wonder uh, earlier, but you also worked with uh, George Clinton. Yes. On Funk With You. What was that process like? J.J. Johnson actually came up with that, with that record. Okay. He had the pretty much completed demo. We got in the studio and was like, man, we got to have, like, George. You have to. Like, the song wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have existed if, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, we didn't invent this. Right. So that's basically what it was. We finally tracked him down after a while. We show up in the studio out in L.A. and he comes in. He's cool. Man, I, I met him at y'all's show. The jam at, session? Yeah, like at a hotel cafe. Oh, God, he, yeah. He was sitting there on front of the stage with like a suit yeah. and a hat. I didn't recognize him because I was so used to him either. doing I thought it was Tariq. <laughs> so, I, so I basically, he's, 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 sitting, he's right there. And I, I hop down off the stage, like right in front. He's kind of in the shadow in the cut. And he looks at me and goes, you a bad motherfucker. I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. I was like, all right, I'm going to figure out how to make this work at some yeah. point. So anyway. Appreciated that. I, I had some cool hangs, man. I met a lot of cool people. But uh, we mowed out to LA, and he pops in, and he's just cool as can be. Mm -hmm. And he's like, "What do you want me to do?" I was like, "I don't know. Just do whatever you do." You know. He went in there for a couple of hours, put some smoke in the air, and just funked it up, dude. It was really sweet. I was telling him stories about how my dad would always say, "Man, you don't." You don't know nothing about music. I was there at the Oakland Coliseum when the mothership landed in 1975. Y'all guys will never have nothing like this. So All right. Being really complimentary and you told him. sweet dude, you know? What you can you George, do? He's the you, best. All right. You got George Clinton. One of the things I'm really curious about is um, every time I've seen you, of course, um, you've sort of come as a, a three-man army, a trio, mm -hmm. a bass, your guitar, and drums. Um, how do you envision us receiving this album in the audience with the, with this particular album musically? Like, how will this translate on well, stage? For this particular outing, showing, mm -hmm. um, my sisters sang on the record with me, so they're going to be coming on the road with me. Okay. And uh, I got to be honest, I'm, I might regret that decision. <laughs> Working with family, because <laughs> no. they don't, man. All the cool points I've earned, they'll just like tell old stories of shit of like me as a kid. And it's like nobody needs to know this. They're older or younger, both. Uh, I'm right in the middle. Are you the middle child? Bro. Oh damn, sorry, so, bro. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, so is that uh, I've got John D's who's been playing keys with me for a while. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we just recently added another key player, uh, Dane Relaford. So it's more elements, you know, to cover all the spaces. You know, there's a, at a certain point, <coughs> you spend so much time recording in the studio, production and having all these, you know, these different textures mm -hmm. to, sh to go out and 
do it as a three, four piece. It just kind of wasn't really doing it. It felt like a waste, you know? Uh, or like no. A, or I think it was effective for what it was because, you know, I, I didn't know you from a can of paint and just having to literally on a recommendation, like, go see this guy. And I showed up and I was mind blown because. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy, man. You're a three man was, army with a three, like, with a three piece. But. Yeah. I, I felt just, like I wanted to do more. I was like, I need that background vocal. I need this, right. you know, this extra little harmony or whatever. So, yeah. What particular songs are are close to your heart on this record in terms of, like, what are your favorites? Uh, my favorite songs on this album are JPEG Raw. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Don't I, start I, I, I just love that groove. Okay. I mean, it's a swing right. with, mm -hmm. like, a backbeat. Right. You know what I mean? So it's, like, kind of the jazziest, little balonious in there. It was like... I, I like the way that that sounds sonically. Yeah. I like that, all the percussion. Um, but my favorite, favorite song on this record is Triumph. And I think it's because if I was to go today, my kids could have something that they could listen to and like kind of understand. They would have some sort of understanding of who their dad is and like direction and things that are important to me because mm -hmm. they're young you know so they're under <coughs> 10 so i'm not sure they quite grasp every everything all i was the gonna way. say are they registering anything about you like is the epigenetics happening like are they picking up instruments are they singing are they oh yeah my 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 uh my middle daughter gia she wanted to sing with us during our new year's eve show and I told her to come up on one song, and she came up for the whole set and just stood up there. Never been on stage before. Right. But thousands of people, not nervous, just hanging out comfortable. And then the next day, she was like, how much are you paying me? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, all right, you know? sure. But, yeah, but my son, he, uh, he didn't want anything to do with guitar until we went out with Guns N' Roses and he saw Slash and he was like, Dad, can you teach me how to play guitar like Slash? I was like, this motherfucker. <laughs> You're just so, dad to them. I yeah, that. yeah that. Want nothing to do with guitar, you know. That's beautiful. That's so, beautiful. yeah. So, I guess in closing, I'll ask, um, JPEG Raw, what do you think, where will this fit in your canon? In terms of, you know, people say like, okay, well, this is my, this is my debut record. This is my dark record. This is the album about my divorce. Where does JPEG Raw fit into your canon? And then when do you, where do you imagine you'll go next? Ooh, after this, that's tough. Uh, where does this fit? I think this is gonna be the record where everyone says I lost my mind. And uh, you think it's a departure record? No. Oh, I, I don't. It, I think it's a, I think it's a I metamorphosis. Don't. I don't. But, okay. You know, folks who want you know that went one you to be Robert Johnson blues. <laughs> it's like, oh, he lost his mind. You know. But don't start. Kind of takes a, a different approach to the. Absolutely, but you know, I'm, I'm being funny. But I think, really, at the end of the day, this is going to be the most diverse, honest fully realized to the most, like the closest thing that I could have imagined. Like this is how I want it to be. This is, this is my, re this is who I am as a musician. This is what I, this is my, this is who we are. You know what I mean? That's all you can be, man. That's all you can be. So yeah, we'll see. But what's coming up next, man, I think I'm gonna get in one of them suits and maestro, that's next. I've always wanted to do that. Thank Andre you, 3000 got a flute album. I've seen four shows and I'm in love with it. Is it? That's, yeah. That seems cool. Because it, it, and that's the thing, when I'm talking about vulnerability, yeah. oftentimes we're so, we're so calculated and well rehearsed because we can't afford to make a mistake or half step. And even our mistakes are well documented. And you know, half of free jazz is the idea of making a mistake sound good. You know, that's sure. what Thelonious Monk teaches us. But, yeah. you know, when we really just get to a place where we're unapologetically ourselves, 
um, that's how we'll grow as artists and, you know, not leave prematurely yep. because of the pressure of what other people want us to be. Well, thank you, man. I, I, appreciate, I you. appreciate this. Thank you, sir. Keep rocking. Gotcha. Right. We'll see you out here. You will.